Ladies and gentlemen, on with the program. Welcome back to Your Health Television Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm so used, I'm so delighted, actually, you could join us today for this very special edition of Your Health Television Program. My first guest, Dr. Hugh Wilson. Dr. Wilson, thank you so very much for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, Dr. Morwood. Uh, Dr. Wilson, I'm really fascinated by this topic of age management medicine. Uh, I'm going to learn a lot in this segment, and I'm, my producers heard me say this before, that I love these segments where I learn a lot. But before we get into that, I know that for years you've been a highly respected board-certified pathologist. So, so let's back up a little bit. We're going to come back to age management medicine, but okay. tell us about what it takes to become a pathologist. We, uh, Dr. Morwood, um, pathology is a diagnostic specialty within medicine. As you know, we, uh, to treat a patient, you have to have the correct diagnosis first. And when I was in medical school, believe it or not, I, I started out intending to be an orthopedist. Um, I was always interested in fitness, and I thought a guy who was interested in fitness should be an orthopedist. But as I went through med school, medical school, I found that I was interested in and challenged by making the diagnosis. Right. And the diagnosis, the, the laboratory, as you know, is a big part of making the diagnosis. So that's how I got interested in it. So, so the pathologist, I remember Dr. Wilson in medical school, some of the smartest uh, students in medical school went into pathology. You guys are sort of considered to be the experts in diagnosis and to some degree experts in disease processes. Isn't that true? That, that's correct. I, the actual definition of pathology is the study of disease and, and the mechanisms of disease. Okay, so, so we know that all pathologists go through medical school, of course. That's After correct. college, you, you have to go through medical school and graduate. That's correct. Graduate. Now, what's the training for pathology like? Uh, well, first of all, the, um, there's the, the internship that we all do, which is your first year after medical school where you do general medical training. And I did a rotating internship that was medicine and surgery. Uh, everything but uh, no pediatrics and no obstetrics, but it did include gynecology, orthopedics, cardiology, intensive care medicine, and then four additional years training specifically in pathology. Four additional years after the rotating internship. That's correct. So that's five years after four years of medical school, which is after getting your college degree. That's correct. So that's a lot of training, studying, working before you're turned loose to, to go out and practice in a hospital or at a university, et cetera. So Dr. Wilson, before you got into age management medicine, and, and perhaps now, are you still doing some pathology? Or you I am. Uh, I have the opportunity. I, I'm in a group with three other doctors. There's four of us in my pathology practice. And that affords me a little bit of uh, extra time now. To We took on a new young associate a couple of years ago, and, and he's working pretty hard. And it affords me a little bit of time to be able to uh, spend uh, a couple of days a week on age management medicine. OK. So perfect segue to my next question, which is age management medicine. Dr. Wilson, I know from your resume you are certified in age management medicine by the, is that the Cenogenics? Sen Sen pronounced Cenogenics, that's Sen correct. Cenogenics Gen Education and Research Foundation. So, once again, this segment I'm gonna learn a lot. I'd like okay. you to teach me, and simultaneously we're gonna teach our audience, exactly what age management medicine is. The biggest part of it, Dr. Morwood, is, is addressing the concerns that middle-aged and older folks have that often aren't addressed by their primary care physicians. You know, when we were in medical school, they taught us how to diagnose and treat disease. And that's how we look at things. We don't, to some extent, well, to a significant extent, we do prevention, but we don't look at it that. For example, treating high blood pressure is prevented. High blood pressure, with rare exception, is not gonna hurt you right now, it might hurt you in the future, and that's why we treat it. But we give it a name, it's hypertension. It's a diagnosis and we have a treatment. High cholesterol is a risk factor but, and lowering it is preventative, but we give it a name. It's hypercholesterolemia or hypertriglyceridemia and we treat it as a diagnosis. The approach in age management medicine is, is not diagnosis and treatment, it's prevention and making people feel as best they can at the age they are. Uh, the tagline for my, for my business, as a matter of fact, is Aging is mandatory, but debility is optional. You, you don't have to feel your age. There are things we can do about it. Uh, okay, now, Dr. Wilson, I want you to say that again. So m aging is mandatory. However, 
being debilitated, did you say? Debility is optional. Debility. Now, please explain that for our audience. What do you mean okay. by debility? Well, being uh, the state of being partially disabled okay. by whether it's a decrease in function or a decrease in motivation, um, you, the disabling your life, the way you used to be, you aren't now, and you're not quite sure why, um, and you want to do something about it, perhaps lack of energy or less energy, less motivation, mo less drive, less determination, more aches and pains, um, and just the desire to uh, see your grandkids grow up. Okay, uh, Dr. Wilson, you know, it's interesting if we look at sort of the history of, of lifespans and we look at the long, longevity of human beings, I think it's pretty well documented if we look a thousand years ago, if we if we look in the Middle Ages, very few people lived longer than 40 or 50 years old. Yes. And then with each ensuing century, I think we can add years. And at the turn of the of the 1900s, for example, I think the average longevity in the United States was about 60 or 65. If we vault forward to 2011, it's not at all uncommon to meet people who are 70 and even 80 and they're still active, isn't that correct? That's correct. So, so let's talk about some of the changes that come along with being alive, but being older. L let's see if we can talk about uh, working out in athletics. Let's see if we can talk about your sexuality and sex drive. What, what about, as, as you said, sort of feeling more aches and pains? And let's, let's talk about sort of an energy level. I, is it true that as we get older, people tend to feel that they're less energetic? That's definitely true. And there's, there is a physiologic basis for it. In this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but I like to say that good hormone levels fall and bad hormone levels rise. By good hormones, I mean your thyroid, your human growth hormone, your testosterone level, your estrogen level in women. Uh, they all tend to fall with age. And those play a major role in our sense of well-being, our energy, our sexual health. Um, on the other hand, insulin, which is a storage hormone and, and tends to make us store fat, tends to go up with age, and in particular with our diets. Um, so we have some hormones going up that, that hurt us and some coming down that don't help us. Melatonin, which is very good for our sleep-wake cycle, tends to fall, and it also helps us make more growth hormone. Growth hormone is good for our positive outlook on life. It's also good for our soft tissues, muscle, tendon, ligaments. Well, Dr. Wilson, I, I, this is fascinating to me. M most of the audience knows that I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm very interested, and I'm dedicated to helping people look their best no matter what age. But this idea of manipulating the hormone levels I is rather a novel idea, and, it, and it's kind of uh, uh, novel and unique to me. But before we go on to some of the specifics, of course, since we're both board-certified, my question to you is, is this science-based? Yeah. I mean, anyone in California, if you have an MD, can open up a shop and say you're an expert in cardiology. You can say you're an expert in aging or, or surgery even. You, so do we have science-based data for the public that says manipulating some of these hormones can actually be beneficial? Absolutely. I'll, I'll just take, for example, I'll take one example. How about testosterone? It's very clear that testosterone levels peak in men somewhere in the, about the age of 20. It's different, it's 18, 22, somewhere around 20. And in your 20s, those levels are falling at about a half percent per year. Starting at about 30 and beyond, those levels are falling at about 1% per year. That's well documented. The other thing is that uh, testosterone, as it circulates in the blood, is bound to a carrier protein that we call SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. And only the unbound or free portion is actually active. Well, SHBG goes up while testosterone is going down. Net result, free testosterone is reduced, and that's the active form. Testosterone helps you, uh, it has, again, uh, drive, determination, energy, sexual energy, libido, and the ability to build muscle mass and not store fat. And the latter two are not just cosmetic issues. Um, fat, uh, fat, of course, is a risk factor for the development of arterial disease, whether it be heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, um, and it also uh, produces chronic inflammation or, or contributes to the development of chronic inflammation, which is bad for our arteries and our joints. Muscle burns more calories per unit time at rest than any other tissue. 
And falling muscle mass is one of the things that contributes to the frailty of older people, falls, fractures, subdural hematomas. So maintaining muscle mass and decreasing fat both have other than aesthetic uh, issues associated with it. They're very important to maintaining our health and our vitality as we get older. And all that's well documented. Well, that's really fascinating to me. Now, let's look at another hormone. You mentioned human growth, growth hormone, and we, we just talked briefly about testosterone, and I want to talk about briefly about estrogen. Okay. So can we talk about human growth hormone? Sure. Is, that's for men and for women. Correct. And then in general, we talk about estrogen for women. Is that right? That's correct. Estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen and progesterone. So let's start with that. Estrogen and progesterone. What happens to those levels with age in a woman? Well, you know, as we were just talking about testosterone with men, where they fall slowly, sort of insidiously, and you, don't, you almost don't notice it. With women, of course, they have the very obvious menopause. It, 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 the average uh, time from perimenopause to being completely postmenopausal might be as much as five years. But there's a, there's a pretty sudden onset of a change in a way a woman feels, hot flashes, emotional lability, and then, of course, changes in her menstrual cycle. And so in women, it's much more obvious than in men that estrogen levels fall. But uh, maintaining good estrogen levels is very helpful for cardiovascular health, uh, for sexual health, for bone health, particularly bone health. As we know, however, there, there is a slight risk of increased breast cancer associated with estrogen replacement therapy. It turns out that some of that risk, at least some of it, is that it's been, estrogen has been to, given together with progestins, which are synthetic progesterone, and it, it appears that a significant portion of the breast cancer risk in women getting postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy is from progestins, and that if you actually use actual bioidentical progesterone, that risk is not nearly as high. Now, what do you mean by that phrase, bioidentical? The exact same chemical structure as what your body makes. If for the last 50 years, the, the hormone replacement therapy that most women have been getting has either been equine, it's been, a, it's been a horse source, or it's been synthesized in the laboratory as a progestin, which is not exactly the same as progesterone. And uh, bioidentical hormones have the exact same chemical structure as human progesterone. Okay, and Dr. Wilson, sometime I, I like to read some of the science behind this, some of the papers. We don't have time to delve into that now. Sure. This is really fascinating. Now, what about human growth hormone? A and that's for both men and for women. Yeah, that's correct. Well, as I said, you know, human growth hormone has many functions, one of which is maintaining uh, soft tissues, muscle, tendon, ligament. But it's also very good, uh, it, it helps promote an overall sense of well-being. People who have adult onset growth hormone deficiency often have a lot of emotional changes associated with it as well. Uh, it's a little bit controversial because uh, of all the medications that you and I might encounter that as a physician we could write a prescription for, it's the only one that's also regulated by the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And I think it's because it's been abused. Uh, people who don't really have a growth hormone deficiency have been using it for other purposes. But it does fall with age. And there's also, if you measure uh, growth hormone levels in the blood, even people who have symptoms will sometimes appear they have a normal level, the lower third of the normal range in their blood, but they have symptoms. And so they do need treatment. If someone's level is clearly low, then they need to be treated. The controversial area is in those people who are in the lower third of the normal range in their blood test, but who have symptoms. And, but it's been shown that those people feel much better. Again, they gain muscle mass, they lose fat, um, and all that helps reduce risk factors for disease. Okay, Dr. Wilson, I, I want to bring up a separate and very different but related issue because this is baseball season, of course. We're big baseball fans uh, in, on the Central Coast in California. You know, you can barely uh, see a baseball game or pick up a copy of Sports Illustrated or Sporting News and not see something about steroids and right. human growth hormone, and, and it's gotten a really bad rap. So, so the obvious question is, there must be a downside, there must be some danger to taking hormones, human growth hormones, steroids, testosterone, et cetera. So do we have data indicating that this is safe therapy? I think that's a very vital question. That's a very important question. Uh, um, it, it, there, is, there is data that it's uh, safe. The concern, let's start with growth hormone. What about the long term? There are people who have had congenital problems with the pituitary gland and haven't been able to make growth hormone, and they've been treated with growth hormone for many, many decades uh, safely. 
but it has also been shown that organ size, all your organs will grow if you're on growth hormone. And at, to date, it hasn't been shown that that's detrimental, but there's concern that it could be. There's also concern that if you have a pre-existing cancer, it could make it grow. So it is a, it's a contraindication if someone has had any malignancy at all, even if they're disease-free now, they should not be treated with growth hormone. Okay. With testosterone, there's been concern that it might cause prostate cancer, but the, I think the data are very clear it does not cause prostate cancer. What it will do is if someone has a pre-existing prostate cancer, it can make it grow. So you have to be very careful to make sure that someone doesn't have prostate cancer before you put them on it. Also, as an age man management physician, as opposed to an athlete who abuses steroids, um, I keep my patients within, a, within the physiologic range. I try to get their blood level back up to the upper third of the normal range and not exceed the normal range, as opposed to bodybuilders, for example, or professional athletes who have, who have abused steroids, and they, they pump up their levels till way past the physiologic level. Okay, Dr. Wilson, this is really fascinating to me. I'm hoping that you're going to come on the program again because this is really, it's novel, and I think that it's important stuff. We need to learn more about it. We have about a minute left. Uh, before we go, I want to give out your phone number, all right, and I'm going to say it again, Dr. Hugh Wilson, you're a board-certified pathologist. That's correct. And you recently opened an office for age management medicine. That's Can I correct. give out your phone number? Sure. It's in Monterey, 831-920-1484. Is that correct? That's I'll correct. I'll say that again. Dr. Hugh Wilson, 831-920-1484. Now, we have about 45 seconds. Now, just tell me about the first visit to your office. Do they get blood work? Can you actually measure these hormone levels? A and another important question is, can you accur accurately measure the titers in the bloodstream of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and human growth hormone, et cetera? Are, do, are we capable of doing that? There are very good assays for measuring those. The, the one that uh, is very difficult, the most difficult to measure is human growth hormone it, because it's, it's um, the pituitary gland makes it in a pulsatile fashion. It doesn't come out consistently over the course of a day. And it has a very short half-life, so it's difficult to measure. However, it's consistent. I just want to explain to our audience what we mean by short half-life. Uh, the length of time that it exists in the blood before it's degraded. Okay. Um, and half-life would be half of the time from the time it's excreted till it's undetectable. Okay. Uh, so we have a, but uh, it, it's a pro-hormone. What it does is it stimulates the liver to make something called somatomedin, also known as IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor number one. That's very stable and can be measured. So we measure IGF-1 as a surrogate for growth hormone. So if we have a few more seconds, I'll tell you, yes, they get all their blood levels drawn before they come to the office. And in my office, I then have a body composition analysis instrument. I can say how much fat they have, where it's distributed, bone mineral density and muscle mass. And then also I have a, an instrument for uh, determining the VO2 max, which is the amount of oxygen you can consume per minute per kilogram. Well, Dr. Hugh Wilson, Age Management Medicine. You are a board certified pathologist, 831-920-1484. Dr. Wilson, this is fascinating stuff. I need to learn more about it. We're gonna have to bring you on again. Dr. Thanks Morwood, so I'd love to come back. Thanks so very much for being here. Thank you. I am Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon and this is your health television program. We're going to come right back after a very brief pause for a very good cause.